Why you call me too deep? I think I'm dying here, man. Welcome to the 3B Video Deep Cut Podcast. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> Aw, yeah. It's that time again for another bi-weekly podcast with your hosts, Rotten Roger DeMarco and... Mm, evil. <laughs> uh, you smell different. I can smell you through the microphone. <laughs> I am freshly showered, so I should smell different. Less, less boozy today. <laughs> smell like Irish spring and donuts this morning. Man... Have you ever have you ever eaten something while taking a shower? You know, I don't think I've ever crossed that bridge. I've I've eaten while shitting, but I've never eaten <laughs> while showering. <laughs> something to mark off the list this calendar year. <laughs> I'll give it a try. You know, uh, sometimes you know you be like eating pizza or whatever, and then you get the old gurglies, and you got to go to the bathroom. But you're like, man, I don't want to sit this down. I would like to finish this pizza it's got like two bites left you know whatever you just take it with you um (laughs) to be fair i think our bathrooms are fucking spotless because we both have bidets and uh uh you know we're all about that that uh bathroom hygiene for sure (laughs) i mean we're gonna live in there half the time anyway so you might as well make it nice and clean and uh comfortable yes uh speaking of comfortable not very clean, though. <laughs> it does not make me feel that way. And no, this movie yeah. is not very clean. Let's, let's yeah, let's talk about the truck stop bathroom of <laughs> that is the Elm Street franchise. <laughs> that, that is this last installment in the Elm Street series. We're at the end of Springwood, Ohio's journey. We'll begin a new next episode, but we can't go. We can't start something new till we wrap something up. So mm-hmm. here we wrap up with 2010's Nightmare on Elm Street, a movie that's 12 years old as of recording at this point in time. How does that that's feel? Bonkers. That is so bonkers to me that it's been over a decade. That technically we have children that are a little bit older than this movie is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's very weird, man. Very weird. It just it feels like yesterday, and I will say this: um, this movie gets its fair share of hate, and uh, you you have uh, kind of opened those gates for me and and let me kind of talk about my issues with this movie, and we've kind of theorized and and we've come up with uh, some interesting theories about this film, and it has kind of changed my perspective. Over the course of the you know five, six, seven years, whatever it's been that you and I have been friends, um, you think I'd use my power for better, better things <laughs> than just turning someone's opinion on a not a great movie into like you know this could be a great movie if we just you'll like it. If we just yeah, we just if you just watch it and think about things that could have been. Mm-hmm. Well, and also uh, the Blu-ray that I have is fairly bare bones, but the Blu-ray you have has some deleted scenes and some making of stuff. So that kind of opened your eyes before my eyes were open. And for clarification, uh, my bonus features are about two steps ahead of Raj's no bonus feature. So uh, not to make it sound like I've got, I've got the addition. Every, everyone wants is like, nah, it's, (laughs) it's still subpar for what we require for bonus features. But I mean, it's a bit more than what was there on all the other editions, so... Eh. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, you know, with the addition of some of these deleted scenes, which I didn't have access to, but you, uh, you know, show, showed me the way that they were on YouTube, and so I got to soak them up, uh, that's what kind of led us down this rabbit hole. Uh, for the listeners, I want to preface. <laughs> this, this movie is... It's, it's good for what it is, but it's rough around the edges. And over the course of these years that Evil and I have known one another, we've sort of surmised that in this uh, you know rubber band ball of a mess of a movie, there's a very good movie in there that was lost in editing or uh, due to producers' feedback or test audience feedback or whatever. We're convinced there's a very good film in this movie 
So we want to talk a lot about that this week. Uh, you know, you, you, you can listen to any number of podcasts Shit, talk about can, the problems with this movie. You can watch us on a live stream for two hours talk about it because we've covered <laughs> this already before. And uh, we'll, we'll touch here and there on it where the, the story goes and where we think it could have and maybe did go originally. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is very much like a, think of it as a very foggy road. And we're trying to just trying to burn that fog out because, you know, yeah, we believe it's a silent hill possible. of roads. <laughs> can you believe this fog? We can believe it. <laughs> Ain't no fog bank out there. We're going to drive right on through that motherfucker and Johnny Depp's uh, custom ride. So, first off, we have the, the challenge of recasting, the ultimate recasting of yeah. Freddy Krueger with... No, with, oh, I was going to say, this is no, no uh, easy task, because you already have a, you have a decades of built-in fan base who can only see Robert England, and this is that era of, uh, especially for me, arms crossed uh, horror fan, like... Don't touch my movie. Why are you touching my movie? <laughs> Who is this asshole? You know, that's not my Freddy. That whole, like, movement of we're dipping our toe into the internet where everyone's opinion matters. <laughs> and yeah. here we are. But this is uh, two, two years, I believe, off of Heath Ledger's Joker. And, man, I was so firmly in that, that, that old arms crossed Raj mentality when I heard that Heath Ledger was going to be the Joker, because that this is the first real crack at the Joker since Jack Nicholson. And I'm like, nah, man, the dude from 10 Things I Hate About You is going to do this? Fuck. Mm -hmm. And then just the trailers alone completely changed the whole game. And from that day on, I was like, you know, I'm going to try my best. I even got fucking Heath's Joker tattoo on my arm. I'm like, my, my symbolism behind this tattoo piece is one, it's a badass fucking Joker, awesome movie. I was like, maybe just try not to jump ahead to those conclusions of it's not going to work out. Like, you know, give it, give it a shot. Give it an honest shot. It's a mat with yes. different conclusions that you can jump to. And eh? I'm trying, and I'm trying not to do that with with <laughs> starting with that that right there. So when it was announced that they were going to redo it, I'm like, finally, yes, give me something. And then they were going to recast with Jack Earl Haley. And I was like, I have no idea who the hell that is. But luckily, <laughs> Watchmen had just come out. And I distinctly remember uh, calling out to work, rainy night, staying at home. And I, this really fucking dates it a little bit. Pay-per-view rented uh, Watchmen on DirecTV and gave this a shot. Solely, I have no interest in the Watchmen at all. I was solely doing it just for... Let's see what the hell this Jack Hero Haley brings to the table because I I yeah. read that he had a big major part in the in the flick. So watched it. He actually is a fedora wearing guy in that movie too. <laughs> but uh, finished that movie and I was like, you know what? I think this guy could do it. I think this guy can yeah. totally reach uh, that level. Just give him give him a shot. I'm willing to give him a shot. Sidebar: Jackie Earl Haley had been in my living room probably once a week since my youth, but. Since I did not know who he was, had no fucking clue. But uh, he's in Maniac Cop 3. He's the junkie who holds up the pharmacy. So I had seen this dude in that role, obviously. Uh, and so he's always been the Maniac Cop 3 guy to me, <laughs> which is a weird you know, juxtaposition compared to your he's the Watchmen guy. Because I think Watchmen was like one of his uh, kind of breakout roles, right? Like he... Yeah. He was always kind of a bit character, and then when he did Watchmen, people were like, this is a guy you got to pay attention to, which obviously led to him being cast as Fred Krueger. And you and I have talked off-air many a times, and also during our live stream, about the the things that he brings to this role. Uh, some are thumbs up, oh, you know, OK USA, and then some are kind of, eh. Uh, there's never anything like that I see and I go, that's his fault. That sucks. You know, uh, mainly our, our gripe is the CGI uh, patch on his cheek so yeah. they can show some depth. Not his fault. Um, Not necessary, though. Right. Not at all. The makeup does a fine job. Yeah, it's it, it takes some getting used to. It's like, you know, 
it's like a stiff drink, like that first sip. You're like, ooh, oh, I don't know if I get used to that, but uh, you give it a little mm-hmm. bit of time, and, and you can. I would, and we've we've also we've said in the past, so like the biggest problem we have with the makeup design for Freddy in this. Yes, it's portrayed more uh, medically medically accurate. Yes, but the biggest problem with it, the only problem re- with it really, is they film it in way too much light. Yeah. Uh, that has been our main critique for years, especially since this film is the the reimagining, the retelling, the whatever remake, whatever the word is now. What do they, what do they call that? Requel. <laughs> yeah, the requel that Scream Five has has deemed a, a term. But we're going in dark Kruger territory. Not a lot of silly one liners. He's got some gross one liners. Not a lot of hokey uh, rigamaroo coming from Kruger himself. He tries, though. They, they they try to do it, and it just doesn't quite work. They're like... Right. So I'm, I'm almost positive that was some production note person going, uh, he's pretty fucking dark. Where's my jokester Kruger? He needs to have a wet dream line in mm-hmm. here. Give us one of those retro lines. And that's... Yeah, where's my crusty the clown Kruger? Yeah, and that's the other thing that's like, you know, if you're gonna... If you're gonna do a different movie, do an entirely different movie then. But they, they have, have the a, balls. Yeah, I was like, just just go ahead and go for it. You've done already. You you jumped off the biggest hurdle. You've recast Fred Krueger. That's gonna be your biggest thing there. Mm-hmm. I was like, just just go all out with it. But they have a weird thing that the I think is another drawback is they have a few oddball, oddball as fuck callbacks to the original. We have a character named Nancy. Mm-hmm. That's the only character we have that's the same as Nan- is, is the name. Nancy is our right. main a female lead. We have the bathtub sequence of the claw coming out of the tub. All which you and I've you and I've talked off air. All seemingly done for trailer moments specifically. Yeah. D- done for trailer moments, but I'm like, why are we having stuff like this that don't really like just be different? I'm like, you're gonna mm-hmm. you're gonna put these little things in. Yeah, they're great trailer grab bits to get people in the theater but well then what are you gonna do like is, is, where's the where's the thought process of post being like okay well we got him in the theater now what <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what are we exactly. gonna do after the fact now it doesn't quite make sense because it's the, and the other one that we hate probably probably the thing we hate the most in this movie is the, is the fucking <laughs> is the wall oh it's so bad it is so bad. It blows my mind that in 2009, 2010, you couldn't fucking do better than they did with spandex stretched over fucking four one-inch boards, like, and backlit. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it. If you look at Elm Street One today on the, you got it on 4K, you got it on Blu-ray, you got it on fucking streaming and four. 1000p or what the fuck ever the highest resolution you could possibly have and you go back and you watch that practical effect in that first movie looks like he's fucking leaning out of a wall looks like a million fucking dollars yeah done with spandex and a little bit of sound design that's yeah. all it is and it's and it works yeah it sounds like wood just like bending Mm-hmm. Works, and then we have 2010, where it's Blah. what we always <laughs> say is practical effects will always have a timeless quality to a degree to them, and digital effects are like a fucking car you buy; they are aged and lose value the second you drive it off the lot. The second it absolutely, hits, the second it hits on the film, it's already starting to de-age itself. So yep. we have this wall digital shot of Freddy coming out, and it looks fucking bad. And I hate knocking like something like that, but it's it's bad. I was gonna say that's coming from a place of pure love from guys like us who uh, we really do like this movie. Like I have fully come around to liking this movie, but there are things like that that are fucking inexcusable, inexcusable. <laughs> exactly. And and off air, I've talked a little bit about my disdain for Rooney Mara, and I know you like her because of uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo remake or whatever. Yeah, that it, that's its own requel. Uh, good movie, good movie. I definitely think one day you need to crack that open and try it out. After 8 p.m., definitely, of For course. Sure. But uh, yeah. I, I really think that might change your uh, perspective on Rooney. Did Fincher direct that? I don't know if Fincher directed that or not. If Fincher directed it, it's probably fucking top-notch. But I just am not a fan of her. 
I, you know, I don't see the Heather Langen camp. I don't see the like vulnerable, uh, sweet, scared, and then you know, like the switch being flipped. She always kind of has the same kind of stoic, wide-eyed, like <laughs> pissy, smart, smart Alec look, and it it doesn't work for Nancy for me. But uh, you know, that's that's just I, a minor complaint, really. And I really want to say we're not being uh, grumpy old men thinking that, but none of these kids in this movie really, outside of Katie Cassidy, really have an X factor that kind of draws you in, which I would have done that too. I totally would have went with that route of being like, you know what? If you're gonna if you're going to insist on there being a Nancy, pull a fucking rug out from us. Have mm-hmm. Nancy be the first one killed. Have her take the Tina role and give yeah. Katie Cassidy the one that actually had the only one who of these kids that have uh, like a presence to it. Have her be your your final girl. She is good. Uh, I always want to call her Tina, even though that's not her name in the movie. <laughs> uh, we've talked about that off air. That's because you can't differentiate this and the original too much. Because they keep going back to those trailer moments. Like, oh, remember the, you know, getting killed on the ceiling? We're going to kind of do that or whatever. But uh, I, I disagree just minorly. Because I think Kyle Gallner steals this show in this movie. Because... We kind of do get the bait and switch a little bit where Kyle Gallner is almost our our final uh, girl, final guy. You know, we kind of get that Elm Street 2 aspect to it. We get way more flashback sequences with his family's involvement in Kruger's death. Yeah. Um, you know, so... I would have been fine with that, too. I would have been fine if he was take, taken. You know, he's kind of yeah. got, like, he hasn't slept in several days for a teenager and kind of an emo, mopey face, but I would have oh, been... Yeah. Yeah, I've been fine more with that because yeah, we get more with him than we do <laughs> with Nancy's character. We know what we know about Nancy that she's an artist. Apparently, she That's was it. Freddie's favorite, and yeah, she, she works smells at, different. Yeah, she works at a diner <laughs> at the Springwood Diner. She works there. We got to talk about that opener at the diner because I don't know how you were with this movie, like going in seeing it in theaters, but this was very much arms crossed, Roger. You know, <laughs> twenty ten Raj. I was sitting there, my arms crossed, going, I don't know how you're going to make me like this. And that opener with the rain and the neon of the diner feels very reminiscent, that opening shot of another uh, Bob Shea film, Alone in the Dark, which is a movie I absolutely love. There's a nightmare sequence that takes place in a diner that's lit exactly like this uh, Elm Street opener. But we get just oodles of atmosphere right off the bat in this movie and then we kind of pump the brakes and it starts to kind of become a standard 2010 uh remake reboot reimagining yeah this this, the the opener to this is fucking awesome it is lit very well it is Mm -hmm. nice and dark it's ominous our our lead guy there um Dean, I think is his character's name. Yep. Actually, like stayed up for like two days, so he looks fucking wrecked when he's uh, <laughs> walking it's around like this greasy diner. and everything. Yeah. Yeah, he just looks rough, and I like the, I like how this nightmare is is set up. And I know you're not a fan, but I like Jackie's little touch of his twitch of the finger with the glove thing we get to see, and it's a great kind of callback to a little that there's a there's a callback I I can get behind is they set up Dean's death to look like a suicide or someone right. else's fault. And it's a brutal, it is still tough to watch today. Even. It's good. It's good. This, this throat stab and rip with this steak knife. It, it definitely is awesome. And that's, that's the most light I want to see on Freddie's face. We get some and it's kind of, it's dark, but we have some of that neon lighting off of it, but like, keep it kind of hard to really tell what you're looking yeah. at. Well, and also in that dream sequence, uh, there's this weird, like, blurry vignette around the edges of the frame yeah. the whole time. Kind of so, like when you've just woken up and you got that sleep in your eyes thing. Exactly. And that's the best way to describe it. So anytime Kruger is in those uh, edges of the frame, it's kind of stretched, distorted, softened. And it makes it hard to kind of focus on what he looks like. You know he's yeah. fucked up looking, but you don't. you can't get a definitive look. And that's perfect. That or other things like um, 
the the dream sequence at the school when he's going to play hide and seek yeah. before he turns and does the the jump scare bullshit. The way he's lit in that sequence is how I feel like he should be lit the whole time. Sort of like uh, John Carpenter was, you know, not lighting uh, Michael Myers in the first Halloween, like when he's across the street and it's just like his silhouette. Yeah. That's, like, that's, that's all you need. That should have been most of the ways he's introduced on camera in this movie. But, of course, every every time he is on camera, it is a jump scare opening to seeing him, which yeah, do it once, maybe twice, but every goddamn time we don't need we don't need it and yeah. uh yeah you're right about the brakes being pumped immediately after that opener but at the same time i feel it's while the brakes are pumped i feel it's put into fast forward because i swear to god and i think i even one time i tried to time it between between the original and the 2010 movie of how far in till in the movie before the kids really kind of pick up on okay you die in your dreams, you die in real life. And it feels like it, it's probably because we get more like Nancy's uh, arm burn. We get some stuff mm-hmm. to kind of set up that like this is what is happening. But it Yeah, feels, pulling the hat out, going to the dream clinic. It feels so fucking stark to be like all of a sudden they're like, I got it. If you die in your dreams, you die in real life. I'm like, how do you know all this already? You don't. Yeah. This Jesse character immediately just knows after Katie Cassidy's death, which is another thing that doesn't look as good. I think we talked about that uh, off camera before about uh, well, yeah, how, definitely during the live stream for sure about yeah. the fucking <laughs> flipping around on the ceiling and that all shit's that hilarious. Shit. Put in that Freddy versus Jason ping pong sound effect on her on that and it works about the same. But yeah, I feel they just they just know what the score is way too fast. Yeah, you should get two TVs, put them side by side and just hit play at the same time. I honestly think the timing is about the same. Like, as far as timestamp, I think it's about the same. But it's just, in this movie, it feels way too faster. Way too much faster. And I think that's because we just don't get, like, the little things you can, that you watching it are supposed to piece together and be like, right. okay, so this, 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 okay, I get it. And all of a sudden, it's just, it's like they're assuming everyone has seen this already. They're not right. interested in bringing a new group of folks into this. They're like... You know what happens, Freddy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, you know, he he, he kills you in your dreams. You, you die in your dreams. You die in your life. You should already know this going in. Yeah, and that's foolhardy on on their part because they're given the avenue to because they do essentially retell his story. They make which this is my all time favorite aspect of this film is that Kruger is despicable. Yeah. We've you know so if we're going that route, we're gonna make him despicable. We might as well. This is your just cause. Like, you're like, I was right. You were wrong. <laughs> yeah. He's been a molester from Jump Street. But, uh, you know, that's an argument for another time. But this movie. No, it's not. This is the right time. This is the right time. You said it for years. People have argued against it. They were wrong. I am right. Here's why. But this movie <laughs> leans leans really hard into that aspect and makes it hard for you to want to root for Kruger. But again, a lot of these teenagers, they're they're nowhere near as charismatic as the cast of the original film. But uh, going back to your Blu-ray and some of those deleted scenes, uh, if if the listeners don't have your specific edition, this is where we can kind of get into these deleted scenes and what they mean for the structure of the film and what film we really think is buried deep in this movie. Honestly, the only the only deleted scene I thought that really looked cool in my in in my memory is the one of Nancy's dream outside, where we get to see an entire dream world, literally, of her walking down the street. And I think it's it's kind of s- similar in the aspect of when she's walking down, when she's crawling in the uh, pharmacy, which is probably mm-hmm. one of the, uh, another like man uh, that first and that dream sequence are fucking awesome. How those are shot. But we get just a shot of her walking down a street and she's, you know, micro-napsing, which is another cool aspect they've introduced in this movie. And it goes from, like, her just walking down the street to her walking down, like, it looks like a hell landscape of uh, boiler room, like, industrial factories and just dark, ominous lighting and 
again, that hazy sleep in your eyes sensation to it. Like, yeah, give me more of that. Give me more delving mm-hmm. into the into these nightmares. Aside from just, I feel doing it just to do it. Yeah, because that's the type of stuff that they had the budget for in this movie. They had a really, they had a really good chance to give us something that we hadn't seen before. And you brought it up. The introduction to the micro naps is uh, a powerful story tool because they get to be awake, but then we get aspects of the dream world kind of flickering in and out. And for my money, this whole movie, every dream sequence could have been like that pharmacy dream sequence. And uh, I mean, that's flawless. That is the best sequence in this movie hands down it's it's done so well the music the cutting in between stuff falling off the shelves all of that stuff is like okay i'm scared you're winning you know what i mean like and that's when the jump scare thing can work because that's the only time i think it does work is when she's sitting in the car waiting on uh quentin and she's having like the quick like glimpses of falling asleep or Freddy's pulling her out of the fucking car before she burns her arm. Like that's where that's the only time I feel like these jump scare things are really working and they fit, fit the motif and you can kind of feel it there where she's smacking her fucking face and trying to wake up. Like everybody's Mm -hmm. been there, like just dog shit tired and you gotta, you gotta fucking wake up. You gotta wake up. You gotta wake up, but you can't, can't quite get there. That's where, yeah, this, this could be working a whole lot better. Mm-hmm. And I'd love if they went more with that. Could we get we get touches of that? Like uh, I know we talked before about when uh, they're back went at the school and she micronapses and sees Katie Cassidy in the body bag, which another yes. fucking trailer shot. No re- pointless as shit to see it. Creepy, but we, creepy, but pointless. It, it is creepy. It, it is super creepy to see her in that doing that fucked up voice in the body bag. But I'm like. There's no setup for that. Like the setup in the original is she sees Tina's body on the fucking news in a body bag with the with, arm hanging yeah, out, arm hanging out. Like yeah, totally shit you see on the news in the in the mid '80s for sure. Just corpses <laughs> just being taken on camera. But we have no. She's never seen Katie Cassidy's body. We we know mm-hmm. she's dead, but but uh, Nancy's never seen her. So why is she right. just in a body bag randomly? There's no even context of them having any interaction at all in the movie, even though they're both in the goddamn diner. Yep. Uh, very. That's very true. They they don't really have a on-camera friendship. They have no... They have really nothing together. Like, maybe a, just that quick, like, two seconds at the at Dean's uh, burial. Yeah. It's solely banking on the fact that we have seen this movie before. Totally disregarding the the new audience which yeah. is what this that's what this film is for it knew it was going to bring in old heads like us that had, yeah. that gr- grew up on the franchise but you got to meet in a middle ground and you got to you got to give these you know new horror horror fans these young kids you've got to give them something to chew on you've got to you got to give them this connective tissue and that's very important just that one little throwaway shot of Nancy seeing Tina on the gurney, you know, that's a two second shot, but it plants in that kid's subconscious. So later when she's at school, she has the dream. So it doesn't make any sense in the remake. So yeah, it doesn't work for a new audience. No. And we also have, we have a, after that uh, pharmacy sequence, we get uh, Nancy's arm slashed. So we have to take her to get uh, that taken care of at the hospital where we have April O'Neil herself. Uh, yeah. Uh, Judith O'D or no, Judith. Whatever her name is. Ho- ho- <laughs> Hogue. 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 Yeah, they're working to fix her arm up there and that's where we have Quentin stealing a epinephrine pen <laughs> off a cart, which is way too easy to do. And uh, I have the, or we have the misfortune of knowing the movie Crank too well. So I'm totally I'm running through Dwight Yoakam's speech and hit in that movie on on Quentin because he just jabs this shit in his arm and takes the whole goddamn thing. Same thing happens in Crank, but in Crank, he fucking runs across the city and has a raging boner the whole time because <laughs> that's a side effect of what like you should be frigid. You're you're sweating, you're, but you're really cold and you got a <laughs> you've got a hard on that could just pierce armor, don't you? 
<laughs> None of that happens to Quentin. I'm like, That's, this is bullshit. <laughs> right. He's a teenager. His dick works just fine, too, so... <laughs> shit, that shit should be able to cut diamonds but on being on a teenager. <laughs> a teenager on a full epinephrine shot. He should be able to battering ram that shit through that bad damn preschool door. <laughs> That's be, true. He should. Be like, I got this, Tina. Ah, pelvic thrust through the door. <laughs> that should, he should be stabbing Kruger with that thing at the end of the movie. Blah. <laughs> then it would be, we turn the tables, you know? We molest the molester. We fuck him to death. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Freddy's laying there like, ah, I like this, but it hurts. <laughs> I'm dying, but in the best way. Ah. Wake up the gimp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good God almighty. <laughs> but yes, we went full into him being a, a molesting, devious figure to an entire yeah. class of kids which I know that's another thing I've talked to you about of like so he so is it the thing that he molested this whole fucking class and he had no Nobody. like MO for like boys or girls he just, just everybody just, just yeah whoever under his, Diddle is, them all. is it like a height requirement is he just like short people like that is his thing that, and then no I one none of these kids can remember it not a one remembers it that is my biggest problem because we we've talked about this. We're both from, uh, you know, average sized towns, and I would assume that Springwood is supposed to be kind of like any town America, you know, average size. But even in a fairly decent sized city, this would be news, especially in right. quote unquote back in the day of 1996. Yeah. Because uh, once you do the math and you figure that out, uh, but yeah, think of OJ trial going on, and then yeah, this would be this would be another nationwide scandal. Mm -hmm. But mainly, my issue is uh, why do I just keep wanting to call her Tina when she kind of Katie Cassidy when she discovers like oh hey uh, I fi finds these photos of her as a kid with Dean and she's like I thought I didn't meet Dean until high school like. And her mom's like, uh, yeah, um, hmm. Who remembers mm -hmm. shit from preschool? <laughs> right, yeah, this whole thing. And it's like, okay, at the very most, they're supposed to be 18. And how many schools are in this, you know, like, in this tiny town? Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like, they would have had to have started school together and continued school together. Yeah. So they've, no you know what I mean? Like... It's not like Dean went to the second preschool. or You know what I mean? Like, how many schools are in this town? That's the issue I have. Maybe it's a highly districted area. Like it's. It could be. I mean, <laughs> you have multiple districts. but I do have multiple districts. I literally, if I cross, like, a street where I live currently, I'm in a completely different school district. It's that, it's that bonkers. So, it, I mean, it's plausible. I don't know how regimented that was in 1996 moving forward but that's I mean, why it, we have area codes <laughs> it, it, it totally it could have been a thing and while dealing with all this and we get that we get the most backstory and then originally we just get told in in a story time campfire style from mm -hmm. nancy's mom here for uh reasons unknown but i'm all right with it we get the whole pretty much backstory in a dream sequence for Quentin where he's watching what these parents do vigilante style to Fred Krueger by trapping him in this building and throwing in a Molotov, cock Molotov cocktail and setting dude on fire. So mm -hmm. we get the entire backstory of this is why he looks the way he looks. This is why he is the way he is. And this is why he's after us. And then I theorize to you, what if we we continued that train of let's just do something completely different. Let's just completely pull the rug out from everyone. We've already done done the biggest thing. What if we go even further with it? Because they toy with us the concept of we killed an innocent man. What if mm. you killed an innocent man? He didn't actually do any of these things. What if we they went full full tilt into that? And they completely did this wrong. And he was an innocent man. How would you... 
do you, do you feel that would change change the landscape of the Elm Street franchise lore character? That, doing that to me is a cop out. What I feel like that would do is that kind of recants everything and uh, makes it okay to like Kruger. If you take that away and you go, okay, then you're in, it's kind of slippery, you know, because what this reboot is trying to do is make him scary again. And, and we were potentially under the umbrella of at least three more films. We talked about that before, yeah, that they had they signed had... contracts for up to two more. Yeah, two uh, two more picture deal with at least with uh, with Rooney Mara and and um, Jackie Earl Haley. Jackie Earl Haley. I want to. I don't know why I keep wanting to say Charles B. Pierce. I'm like, nope, that's the guy <laughs> that made a, that made Boggy Creek. Not in this movie at all. <laughs> no, but so if we're under the impression that we're going to do a trilogy, uh, and if you get to the end of the first film and you say, you know, um, he was innocent. Then you kind of give the audience carte blanche to be like, oh, it's okay for me to like Kruger now. So by the time two and three happen, uh, you run the risk of him becoming a joke again. Starting to be more silly because the audience is allowed to let their guard down and like him and things like that. And that's where the problem is for me with that. And, And kind of following along with that logic, you and I had talked off air about how we think a trilogy would absolutely crush it. You know, because I'm a big fan of epics. I like a movie that's two hours, three hours. Like, I'll sit and I want to watch a long movie. I need a lot of character development. I'm totally fine with that. And with this being a trilogy, we had talked about stretching this story over the course of three films. Yeah. Similar to the Freddy's Nightmares TV series, how the pilot episode is his trial and his uh, execution, essentially, and his resurrection. Yeah. So if we so if we could do a full first movie with his... Make it a courtroom drama, I believe, is what we were talking about off air. Yeah, you... Uh, I can't remember what your, the, the, your structure of the three was, but I was like, ooh, I would want mine to be the first movie. I would want to be the entire run of him uh, doing his his dirty deeds as regular guy Fred Krueger and that first movie ends with his arrest and Mm. I want the whole second movie to be the trial three fourths of the way through the movie you end the trial him getting off and you end the second movie with the vigilante killing of Krueger and the third movie is entirely and you make it the longest one like you make the, the other ones hour 48 the two hours you just go full Lord of the Rings shit and go like a three hour finale where the third movie is the entire dream demon aspect to it. And you take the Nancy approach from the first movie is you guys got to pull him out of the dreams, confront it, you know, tell him he's shit and then turn your back on it. And that's yeah. how you end it. That's how I would have done the trilogy. But give it, but give those characters three hours to figure out how to defeat this demon as opposed to two minutes on camera going, you know what? I got it. That's why I would bump it into that into three hours, because I would give us two hours of what would be the standard story of they're having the nightmares. Slowly f- bumping people yeah, off, they, yeah. They, yeah take, take a few out. They figure slowly out what, what the score is, how to handle it, and then it comes down to one, and then, yeah, we that last hour you, is the whole kind of... Un- I would like that whole last hour just be the build into the last nightmare, the confrontation, the end. Yeah. Uh... So, so my structure is very similar to yours. So, I don't know if you've ever seen the Denzel Washington movie, The Hurricane. That's based I on love the, the Hurricane. Okay, so here's my pitch, following a very Hurricane esque uh, format. Here's the story of the Kruger man. Yeah, <laughs> he molested the children all in the land. So you start it with a crime being committed, or you start it with uh, a child crying to their parents, you know, or the parent finding scratches on a kid's back during a bath or, you know, you start like, it's this wholesome, like parents getting ready to have dinner or get ready to put a kid to bed. And then they discover the scratches and, you know, 
blah, blah, blah. And we get into uh, finding Kruger, arresting Kruger, Kruger getting a lawyer, going to trial. This whole first movie is we don't see him hurt a kid. So there is the potential that he's innocent. Like the, I think I told you about this other movie called True Story with uh, James Franco. That was Primal Fear. Oh, and also Primal Fear. That's another one. Primal Fear is the one I remember us talking about. All great courtroom movies. And Primal Fear, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen this movie. He did that um, shit. Yeah, he's (laughs) touted as an innocent man. And so Richard Gere is going to get him off. And Richard Gere spends the whole movie crushing this trial, gets him off. And then Edward Norton goes, by the way, I am a bad guy. And it's like, so I feel like that's your structure for your first uh, Elm Street film is we kind of we make Kruger seem innocent, which they do a good job in this 2010 remake with him running and being like, what do you think I did? I didn't do anything. He's very believable. (laughs) Yeah, very, very like scared. So you present him as scared and give him kind of like a Ted Bundy aspect because a serial killer would have that, you know, I'm a kind of a smooth talker and the jail and the, the guards kind of like me and, you know, they'll let me go to the library by myself because I'm not a threat, man. I didn't do this. I'm, you know, like in the wrestling business, he would be quote unquote working the boys. Yeah. And that's exactly what Kruger would be doing, but it's open for interpretation. So you're watching this movie and you go, uh, maybe he is innocent. So the whole movie is this, it's, it's walking this uh, Hitchcock suspense level where you're like, is he a bad guy or is he not? And then you drop the bombshell on him at the end that he is a bad guy. And uh, that's how we end with he's a bad guy, supposed to go to prison, but then the judge throws the case out because something was done incorrectly. And we end the first movie with him kind of being like, I'm free, you know? So then you get the second movie where you get all the parents in Springwood going, you're a piece of shit lawyer. And you know, and we got to figure something out. We got to take this motherfucker out. They kill the lawyer too. (laughs) Then they go to the cops and they're like, arrest him. You got to arrest him. You know, he did touch our kids. And then the cops are like, we can't do anything about it. You got to do a whole new case. He's got to do something else. We got to catch him doing something else. So then you have all the parents like, they're not going to do it. We're going to do it. So it's kind of this whole them planning out. Like I could see another, another hour and a half, two hour movie of parents, like watching him, figuring out his routine, I don't even knowing where he's going to be. I don't even, I, I would, I would, I felt mildly hard time believing that. I would totally think once the verdict came down, like within hours, it'd be evil dies tonight. Freddie yeah. burns tonight. It'd be some Captain Howdy shit. <laughs> yeah, it would be mob mentality, revolt. Like that courtroom would look reminiscent of the Capitol. <laughs> but see, here's how you here's how you play it: is these parents are smart, and they want to leave no evidence, and they want to make sure everyone involved isn't going to turn them in because they don't want to go to prison for murder. So they've got to cover it up. You're not going to. That's where are you going to are you going to have the aspect where we don't have a cop that's included on on this. Uh, I like the idea of having a cop that's included. So would you have would you have the cop included on, in yours, or would you have it not? I would. would. I would for sure. That makes it that makes it easier. <laughs> yeah, because then you know the law isn't going to do anything. But evidence got lost. I don't know what happened to it. So that's how you end that second one, is with him being burned alive, and then we we end it on a kid having a nightmare, like where you Ooh, see yeah. Kruger sil- you see Kruger silhouetted, and you get the laugh. And so you get this cliffhanger of an ending like, oh, my God, he's dead, but he's in these people's dreams. Like he's after these kids that he molested or whatever. And then you got to wait two years for the next one to come out where he's a dream demon and he kills everybody. Like it's box office fucking gold. (laughs) Box office gold. If we can fucking have 4,000 Marvel movies where the same motherfuckers jump off the same building and crack the same concrete, we can have three fucking... Kruger epics. He's going to do the superhero landing. Look, he's going to do the landing. There it is. Fucking hooray. Okay, so then I'm just left with the how would you if we're, we're just reconstructing all this, how would you bring <laughs> the element of him 
resur being resurrected as a demon thing because I've like in my mind there's one of two ways you could go is either uh, like a psychological route of like these kids were touched and have suppressed that memory and the suppression of that memory in their subconscious is what's manifesting in in this way as as one aspect you could do it and the other one I thought of that like what if we just were to combine a bunch of other stories into one just jam-packed story like what if we took one of those 18 million uh script ideas for freddy versus jason where they resurrect jason through the cult aspect so what if we had a cult of fred heads what if we just brought in because i mean if we take the time frame of when this happens serial killer fascination is fucking strong you're all about that fred heads <laughs> well <laughs> you were for, just... you were for west craven's new nightmare as well I, I, I was, but like, so what if we took that and did this, did a, the cult thing of people are just so into serial killers that they just become fans of Freddy, and because of them somehow they resurrect uh, Freddy by by intentional means, kind of a thing. Like, so how will, uh, or do you have a different way you would you would prefer that this, uh, or would you even bother explaining at all how all of a sudden he's a dream demon? See, I like I like your first idea a lot of the it's the suppression. It's the parents uh you know being like this didn't happen, like therapy, this didn't happen, whatever and and these kids knowing it happened and they can put on a face in public and be like, "You're right, I'm okay." You know. I can tell my therapist I'm okay, I can tell my parents I'm okay, uh whatever. But I, the fact is, I'm emotionally damaged i'm scarred and every time they close their eyes they see him but it's not enough that it's if if it was just one kid seeing him it wouldn't bring him to life but all the kids are so damaged that they're they're dreaming of this man the cumulativeness and, yeah and and they kind of what i think would be neat would be they all have this vague recollection of him when he was alive, but they know he's been burned alive, but they didn't see it. So each one of them's like version of him in the dream, slightly different, you know, gangly with real long arms or, or, you know what Slinger I mean? Or man. Yeah. You know, every one of them kind of has their own version of him in their head, but they're so scared that the dreams, if they die in their dreams, they die in real life, which just like Wes Craven's, uh, you know, inspiration for the real story is these nightmares actually killing kids, I believe, in the Philippines. Uh, gosh. It's like H M O N G Hong Min. Uh, Hmong. Hmong Min. Asian descent. Yeah. <laughs> Dying in the middle of nightmares. I don't know, maybe my aspect was this I just wanted one silly element. Uh, you want that Fred Heads di- or you want that Fred Heads uh, gang cult. so bad. <laughs> yeah. Maybe because that was one of the only scripts I did read. That uh, was like one of two scripts I remember reading when that movie was not made yet. And like what the story could possibly be. And like that was, that was like, Peter was, Jackson, right? I uh, know how he was had the dream lover thing where all the kids were going to sleep intentionally, and beating the shit out of him, kind of a thing. Mm. Uh, I think it was uh, David Scow, uh, the spot one of the splatter punk guys that did the Fred Heads cult thing. Oh, nice! And I was just, I was just, I just liked that an aspect. Of, and I, would, and I have no idea how I would connect it all, but I just like in my head, I'm like, so what if this fascinated cult resurrected him by some means, and then we just have just Freddy coming back and just killing the shit out of all these people, like <laughs> lickety split, like, like they've unleashed it and they had no idea what they were actually doing. Nah, I got and, you. Um, that, that's probably just me wanting to insert a little bit of c- uh, classic silliness into this right. series because. I think both of our takes are pretty, pretty kind of in line with how this movie is. It's pretty dark, dark, and not not uh, as not traditionally fun as the Elm Street series ended up being from three, four, five. See, and I like that aspect. Like, if if they were to do this as a trilogy, if we were going to bring Kruger back, this is one of the things that I think they don't explore enough in the Elm Street franchise. With the exception of, I think, four and five, because Alice's dad is a 
perfect example of a broken man. Like he plays grief so well, and and like better than any parent in this movie. Every parent exactly. in this movie seems to do pretty all right with killing somebody. <laughs> yeah. So here's what I think you bring to that third movie is once these kids start having these nightmares, um, you get more of that that mob aspect from the the second film. You bring those parents all together again, but they're all helpless. And they're all kind of discussing, like, hey, is is Katie dreaming about him? Yeah, so's Johnny, or whatever. Like, and but they're they're so fucking helpless and so scared that they can't help their kids. And then the first murder happens. And all these parents realize we could protect you when it you know, when it was real, but now we're helpless. So you kind of dive into that human aspect uh a lot of people really shit on that pet cemetery remake you and i have our issues with it but there's there's something about the uh adults and the grief the grief process i i feel like that's something that's missing so much from the elm street franchise is if you want to connect with the the old school audience like us now we're not teenagers we're parents yeah so give us parents being helpless and sad and hurt and then you know make these teenagers likable like previous Elm Street uh, Elm Street entries and take them out and and rip the fucking heart out of the audience I think that's what you do and then you're inadvertently you're making Freddy absolutely terrifying you're giving teenage audiences uh, characters to relate with and you're giving old Kruger fans parents to relate with and their villain back being a villain and there's there's money to be made in a broken clancy brown yes absolutely listen if quentin tarantino were to make this trilogy (laughs) you know he keeps wanting to to dip his uh toe fetish into (laughs) horror (laughs) so uh you know i don't know if i want to see clancy brown's feet though I do, but I mean, don't you think, dialogue-wise and story structure-wise, especially with the the novel story uh, style that he does, where it doesn't follow a linear timeline, don't you think that he could do something special with Elm Street? I feel he totally could, and I would also I would like when you're going back to these parents broken down the road. Late years later after the incident, I would like an aspect of uh, not necessarily uh, Freddy invading their dreams and killing them, but maybe some supernatural means of taunting them. Yes. Like, similar to like we have, like in part four, we have that photo on Alice's mirror. Of, and know, the see, postcard in five or whatever, yeah. Yeah, see you in hell thing. I was like, if we could just have some aspects like that, just further furthering Clancy Brown into like going for the bottle. Or the gun. We get the Kruger phone calls. Because those are terrifying. Oh, the new new nightmare phone calls, yes. Yeah, that's your taunt right there. I touched them. (laughs) Oh, yeah, dude. Scary. Yeah, give me Clancy Brown unshaven for like three years in a bathrobe (laughs) (laughs) with Quentin's looking eyes (laughs) just getting his phone call. And like just have him ripping the phone out of the fucking wall at one point and just throwing it in a fireplace. Make that a whole thing. Make every parent getting the phone calls and just make like make that a like almost a subtext thing if they just are phones just piss them off. So there's no means of communication. <laughs> Everyone is using like letters and shit like that. Any other means besides the telephone like the, like and make that make that put that put that in the fucking dialogue of like the kids being like, "Yeah, we don't have a how a landline anymore." Like, "Do you have a landline?" It's like, "We haven't had a landline in years." We don't have a landline either. Why do none of our parents have landlines? Yeah. We have no phones. Like, just the sound of a phone ringing, like, fucking puts them through, like, some PTSD. That's some 976 evil shit. Every time you hear the phone, you're like, ah, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. There's something there. There's There's a movie there, or three movies there. All this stuff we've talked about is stuff that you can almost potentially see going on in this movie. But it's mm-hmm. just, it's buried amongst, um, it, our opinions entirely, uh, studio meddling 
trying to make a like a the most widely open movie for Accepted, the audience yeah. and just trying to pump out and like will this work do it just do it again and put in some aspects that are from the original series to bring in these old fuckers and just do it again but and i i swear if we ever have the, the like as much as you were like damn it he was a pedophile and and i know it <laughs> like one of these days if there's a a a version of a Snyder cut of this movie that comes out, we can be the ones going, no, no, no. All you people hated this fucking movie and didn't believe anything good would ever come of it. But mm-hmm. now you're not you're not allowed to jump on the bad wagon because we already owned it, motherfuckers. <laughs> we owned it back then when we knew we knew there was something good about this. It just wasn't there yeah. visually for everyone to see yet. But we could see that shit. Our eyes are wide open. And it's it's mainly the editing, right? In my opinion, with this movie, they start like they're on the right track, and then they just make some very bizarre editing choices. You and I have both talked about it. The kind of like speed ramp, and then the uh, you know jump jump scare cuts. These weird things that they insist on putting in to the movie when the atmosphere is perfect in certain aspects, but then they choose to like let's take it a little further. And by these extra one or two seconds or even sometimes one or two frames that are added in, you're kind of almost shooting yourself in the foot by taking away all of that tension and just giving it a ooh boogie boogie move like moment. Perfect example is like Jesse's death is he's immediately uh, collared for uh, Chris's death. He's thrown in jail. He had, and mm-hmm. it's a pretty cool dream sequence scene how it, how his death goes down, but in the real world he's just in a jail cell with another dude, and his chest just explodes. Mm-hmm. And while it's fucking hysterical to watch this other guy in the jail cell start pounding on the door, and going, I didn't do it. Like think about if we if they'd kept that motif they just established, and we just had had like a tussle between Freddie and Jesse in the dream world. And then you just, in the real world, we see Jesse go under the bottom bunk and start, you know, unconsciously untacking this other guy. Mm-hmm. And just have it look a little bit more like you could pin it on a, a prison room scuffle that ended in this guy's death. Instead of his chest is fucking exploding like like Jesse Ventura in Predator. Right, like he's thrashing in his bed so the cellmate gets up to be like, you all right? And like leans over him. Yeah. So the camera's behind him, so you can't see what he's doing, but then you see blood splatter. So it, on camera, it looks like it looks like he stabbed him or did something to him. And you could totally go with like he had a shiv just maybe for protection on him, mm-hmm. the other guy in the in the in the cell. And you go with he's got a claw, so instead of blowing it through his whole chest, you know, over the top style, you actually go with him being cut, him being stabbed, him being slashed. And then you could utilize the shiv knife and have a, like, oh, like, no, he killed Chris, and then he died in a scuffle in prison. There is no Fred Krueger. Stop it with that nonsense. Yep. That's how you bring back the, an old concept better in the new movie. And maybe all this ain't there, but I feel like it was there, and this something else caused him to go, like, just put a hole through his chest and let's call it a day and move on. Yeah, there's definitely something there. And uh, the next time you, listener, watch this movie, watch it under the guise that Evil and I have said that they just just look at this editing process. See what's right, what's wrong. And and you'll be able to tell where exactly someone put their finger in and said, "Mm, let's change that. You know what I mean? Like, it's so obvious once you realize, because, uh, you know, we only briefly touched on those deleted scenes, but every single one of those deleted scenes is a much darker tone. There's there's some stuff going on in those deleted scenes. I'm not sure the aspect of uh, the one with Quentin being, like, unzipped and Freddy's underneath his face. Like, that's a that's a strange one. I'm curious what yeah. the rest of that that tale is. But, yeah, just little bits that kind of show a little bit more, like, of a story of darkness that could be there. 
mm-hmm. and you had to get rid of that fucking bright ass lighting and there's there's something that that's there there's something that's there yeah there's a much better movie hidden under the surface my blu-ray does not have commentary which is a sad state of affairs i don't know if yours does i know i I've don't asked you about it but i don't know if i don't looked. think it does because i don't remember seeing one but i could be wrong i'm gonna have to go back up immediately after we're done recording and take a look to see if there is one but i don't think there is it's literally like there's a couple of making of blurbs that are like under five minutes i hate those yeah yeah <laughs> it's real quick like little bits and then yeah a couple of flash uh, deleted scenes that don't really have a whole lot of context but it just it gives you a glimpse of like you know there's more mm-hmm. and you know it it's, exists and it's not living in that um, Jason New Blood territory where this the deleted scenes were cut trashed and thrown away we're in the digital filming era so all this film exists it's somewhere and it's in pristine condition it just needs to be put together by a, a real fan <laughs> instead yeah. of you know uh, a platinum dunes executive <laughs> absolutely yeah give us all the raw footage of that movie and i will cut together a much better movie for you i promise <laughs> and we didn't talk about it tremendously but did you have a brown panty award winner for this film or is it as suspected I think the same as mine Chewy Dewey Chewy Chewy <laughs> oh yes <laughs> well then no my mine of course was how I talked earlier I'd rather have it flipped and we have Nancy get off than we have Katie Cassidy uh, mm. take over because I really really like her character and think that she could have been could have been the star of this Rooney Mara does okay Mac. <laughs> Maybe because I yeah, see under that guise of the other movies she's done there where she's fucking awesome. But Katie Cassie, I think, just owns it. Owns it in this thing. And it's a shame when she goes. I think she could have been an interesting foil. And that'd be a yeah. good, been a good flip. You don't really have a blonde. Shit, I don't think you have any blondes that are really uh, <laughs> that are there at the end of any of these movies, really. Not uh, outside of not uh, Elm Street. Outside of Kristen in three, and she's part of a more or less ensemble, and mm-hmm. she doesn't really have a big hand in the death blow of three, and she gets it off pretty fucking quick when we go into the next one. But you don't really have a blonde that is a strong uh, female lead outside of Kristen from three in this. That's true. Yeah, uh, redheads and uh, brunettes. Yeah, right. Well, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, a pretty uh, pretty good combo, you yeah, ask me. Yeah, I always forget uh, the actor's real name. This is uh, Chewy, man. He's Chewy and everything. He's, ch- he's Chewy from uh, the Friday remake. Which uh, what a what a contract and like what a what an awesome contract man to be. I'm in both Elm Street and Friday the Thirteenth. The main issue you and I both have with his death in this film is who uploaded that video. <laughs> that's a, that's my main issue. Yeah, I'm like who he's did a that? character. He's a character that I would love to have seen an actual sequence with, not via webcam. Like, put yeah, put Jesse's goofy ass face on a fucking webcam and kill him that way, and give me Chewy in his role or in Quentin's role, even really. I would have been fine with if it's Chewy and Katie Cassidy at the end of this mm. movie that are the survivors. Really go outside of like expectations of a norm. Yeah, that would be way different. People yeah. would be like a blonde yeah. and an Asian survive the movie. What? Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're talking crazy today, folks. We're talking crazy. But we are talking <laughs> Elm Street 2010. We are in crazy town. Yes. This is a crazy movie, dude. There, There's so many different weird things. We didn't bring it up. I mean, we're basically at the tail end. But uh, my least favorite thing, Kruger-wise, in this movie, I mean, d- other than the, the finger shuffle which you happen to really like I do love uh, that is it the I, mm, oh no I like I like that mm, I don't like the the finger blade sparklers that oh. really bothers me that I don't know why I don't know why either because we pretty much have that in the dream child when you have that in basically every 
Elm Street movie, there's sparks that come off, but they just feel so artificial in this movie. Like, way too much. Like, he's fucking spot welding. <laughs> yeah, like, he's just gliding his claw across that pipe. He's not, like, scraping it. It's just, mm-hmm. he's just touching it. <laughs> yeah, and it's literally like he's fucking arc welding or something. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking crazy. <laughs> It just drives me nuts. It's like, do you have Roman candles on the tips of your fucking blades, or what's going on over there, man? Again, I think, and that's, I, I want to say that's another one of those deleted, like, quick scenes, is there's, like, shots of a long stretch hallway where there's just candles lined up on both sides. Like, a million fucking candles haven't helped whoever lit all those fucking things. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we're not going to use that scene. Motherfucker. Yeah. Uh, that production assistant had a hell of a day. It's like, quit opening the fucking door. The wind keeps blowing these out. Like nobody walk down the steps. You're gonna, t- you're gonna blow one out. That one's blown out. I don't care. Roll, roll camera. <laughs> you fucks, roll camera. Digital camera or digital uh, candle <laughs> flames. Digital flickers. You know, <laughs> yeah. Go get a bunch of flameless candles. <laughs> That that'd be the only time where I deem CGI okay is because I don't want to have to light fifteen hundred fucking candles and then have fourteen people in the room moving around and accidentally blowing them out. So I got to jump in and risk lighting myself on fire. Yeah, not to mention you know that's that's not like how filming is like. All right, we got it. Move on. You know that was a, probably a fucking like several hour shoot. So it's like all these candles are slowly burning down. You're like, mm-hmm. Well, we're not gonna have that stay the same. We got to replace some of these candles out. They're burning down too fast. Man, just yeah. Imagine two guys on the side. It'd be you and me. One, one of us has like a big fucking Christmas sack of candles, and the other one's got lighters. Like, all right, here's a new one. Run in, swap it, light it. Like it's a fucking tag team. Yeah. Throw me the throw me the old one, and I'm throwing it in a fucking trash bag, and you're taking the new one, lighting it, sitting it down. <laughs> We're trying to find two a way for for both of us to like have multiple aiming flames in each hand. Like, oh, if I hold <laughs> them like this, I can hit, get three aiming flames going, so I can light six candles at a time. So, <laughs> have K and B, whoever prop department, build me a Kruger glove that's fucking <laughs> aiming flames. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hook it up, son. I'm trying to light all these fucking candles in a timely fashion. <laughs> like, call me Ghost Rider on the walkie-talkies when you want our attention. <laughs> Flame on. I think I see something in the back of the refer- closet. <laughs> uh, that being said, we've spent about an hour and eight minutes kind of diving into what we think uh, a trilogy, <laughs> Elm Street uh, trilogy, would be. But uh, again, if you want to hear us talk more in depth about this film, you can find it on YouTube. 3B video, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2010 live discussion. About a two hour show where we get into pretty much every single aspect with some visual aids and other things of that nature. So um, if you want that. If you've not gotten your fill enough, there's where you mm-hmm. can get a bit more. But. This is the end of the Elm Street series. We gotta, we gotta move on to other territories, but we can't go on to all these other territories till we wrap up Elm Street proper. Mm-hmm. And we can't el- wrap up Elm Street proper unless we join the bandwagon of folks who just fucking hate this movie because we're we're full of shit. This movie is not <laughs> isn't good at all. There's nothing good at all about it. And you know how we know that's true because we went to where you go to critique films. We go to the Amazon one star reviews. Hated it. Oh, so 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 many. I feel like I'm, I'm a rep. Uh, well, we're gonna give some one stars, just you know, because it's what we do. But I feel like when it's all said and done, I want to find a five star review. I want to find someone who loves this fucking movie. I I like that idea. Just because everyone hates this film, like Marlo. <laughs> On July 30th, 2019, Marlo says one star, extremely lame. You can't remake a movie with a character that has been set in stone. This new Freddy is charmless and lacking any kind of wit. Dream sequences are sur- are not surreal enough. And if this mm. movie had been made without the previous franchise, it would have flopped even harder. This version blows. Wow. Sidebar, seven people found that helpful uh he's not 
wrong about the if you if you aren't a fan of the other franchise, you know, because we were already talking about that. Like, yeah, it's kind of built in with all those trailer moments and shit. You you got to know Kruger to even remotely appreciate this. I think. Yep. So next on the list is E Roman. On April 28, 2020, one star, garbage. Hollywood, just stop. Stop it. Nothing new, original, shocking, or worthwhile here. Stick with the original. The only one will get the. This one will only give you nightmares if you watch it all the way through. <laughs> Snooze fest. <laughs> Pew, me, 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 me. <laughs> Fine. Wow. Hey, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> I was listening to another podcast. And like, That's how Scott Hall would sleep. Is, uh, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> the bad guy, Chico. You know what Scott Hall's favorite Chinese food is? I don't. Lo mein. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you know what Bruce Lee's favorite drink is? What's up? <laughs> well, now that we're both going to be canceled after that. Uh, Yay, hey, that's not a racist joke. That's a Bruce Lee joke. <laughs> yeah, that's not a gay joke. No, that's an Australian joke. Aww. <laughs> hey, basketball reference, deep cut. <laughs> so, back to Honey on September, 29, September 24th, 2019. Honey says one star. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Wasn't impressed. I'm a diehard old school Freddy fan, and this has nothing on it. They did explain the story better, and back in the day, and back in the day, but the original was a lot more creative. Hmm. Well, yeah, that I can't fault that re- review either. Really, like they did explain it, explain a lot more stuff. Hmm. And we have someone, a stranger in a strange land here, with R. Pierce on September seventh, twenty twenty-one. R. Pierce says one star, best of the series. Mm. Best of the entire series. This is the five star? No, it's a one star. <laughs> wow, okay. That's why he's a stranger in a strange land. He doesn't know where he is. <laughs> I don't know how stars work. <laughs> the uncolored stars mean that that's good, right? One sure. star means number one star, number one. Right? That's what it is. Could be. Maybe we're just doing it wrong. I, I, yeah, he's the only one doing this thing right. Let's all follow R. Pierce. Uh, But next after him, we have Daniel Priest on November 23rd, 2015. He says one star. Don't watch. Horrible addition to the Freddy Krueger saga. (laughs) That's it? That's it. Oh, I'm going to watch. I like this one from Andrew on May 28th, 2020. He says one star. Run. (laughs) (laughs) I like in his his description is awesome. I love this. Worst remake ever. Not the seller's fault. That's true. I don't give this seller one star. Don't shoot the messenger. The product <laughs> he had was garbage, but it's not his fault. <laughs> run. Yeah, run. And another maybe maybe too truthful one star from Sam Weiss. January 16th, 2014. He says one star, too many jump scares. This movie relied too heavy on loud music to startle rather than building effective scares. I would not watch it again. Ooh, boogie boogies. Seven people found that helpful. Woof. Dang. Seven Kruger haters out there. Yeah. Let's see. Five stars just to balance out. Oh, this one doesn't work. Just I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just the... This person may be stretching to reach for a, a five star from Jacqueline Snyder on May 19th, 2019. Five stars. Good price. <laughs> like, no, no. Give me something. Give me something else here. Here we go. We got Alfie Numeric. All right. Alfie E. Numeric on October 23rd, 2019. Five stars. Jack Hero Haley nailed Freddy, Kr- nailed Freddy Krueger's role. It's too bad people tend to not give remakes a chance because the originals are classic. Well, we will always have the 80s version 80s version one, so give this one a chance. Visually stunning, 
and it still snatches your breath from time to time. I already know the story, but I was still on the edge of my seat. Spoken like a true open-minded person. Yeah, he was like, I'm going to give this a fucking go. I like that. I think more people should be like that. So, uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's not what the internet's made for, sir. It's made for no. slandering others anonymously. Yes. It's not a place for praise. Made for shitting on uh, <laughs> on movies. It's made for telling everyone that I've made better shit on film by shitting on film. <laughs> Speaking of uh, platforms for shitting on things or praising things, uh, it's important to note that we are just like you. We're just a couple of guys who decided one day we were going to critique films or or whatever, what have you, make films. It's essentially, we're like, let's just talk about movies like we normally do, but let's just record it so we can have evidence of such things. And it took a while to build a structure, but we wouldn't have been able to do this or build a structure without the help of Anchor.fm which is the website that we use to create our podcast. So if you are like us and you want to sit around with your buddies and talk about movies, uh, foods, whatever it is that you're passionate about, it's just a click away at anchor.fm so you too can create your own podcast and have your very own platform to talk about whatever you want whenever you want. And it's super fucking easy to do. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. Anchor makes it so easy that it puts your show out on almost all platforms. Whatever it is you're using to listen to stuff in, you can probably find it if you're going through Anchor. Using Spotify, using Podbean, they're covered, man. It does all the work for you. You just record your show, Anchor puts that stuff out there, and people will find it. It's that easy. It's so easy. I could do it. It's so easy. It's not a nightmare or something. (laughs) It's so easy. It could be confused for Sunday mornings. (laughs) And there you have it. Well, now that we're done with the Amazon one star reviews, evil, what does that mean? (laughs) (sighs) You know, it comes at an appropriately, uh, uh, almost sad time because uh, as of time of this recording it has uh, been officially confirmed by the man himself that Triple H is retired from in-ring competition uh, due to you know uh, heart issues which probably stems from maybe substances he used to get so goddamn big uh, that he will not admit to taking but come on vitamins baby yeah <laughs> jelly beans someone, someone took all my jelly beans <laughs> <laughs> Someone took all of Triple H's jelly beans, so we won't see any more in-ring work. Maybe just appearances once in a while, so no more no more ass kickering from the game. That doesn't mean it's time to stop playing that game. It's time to play the game. Time to play the game. It's where we play the game, and how you play it, and mm, you smell different. Mm. Jesus Christ. I'm uncomfortable. I'm Jesus going home. Jesus ain't got nothing to do with this place. <laughs> I'm going to make a mess all on your face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's right. If you are listening to the Deep Cut Podcast and you are new, welcome. Uh, if you're wondering what is the game, well, let me break it down for you. The prop game is in and of itself a deep cut you're going to pick a prop from the film that we are covering that is not something off of the well-known beaten track we're covering the elm street franchise so you cannot say i want freddy's hat sweater glove whatever get that shit out of here that's a cop out you cannot do it that's not deep enough yeah as evil likes to say you're listening to the deep cut podcast so go deep or fuck off. <laughs> you motherfuckers. It's go crucifix deep or go watch a different exorcism movie. Because <laughs> you ain't got the balls to play it the right way. Here I come, Exorcist 3. No. Uh, uh, so let us know in the comments on uh, Spotify or wherever 
uh, on our Patreon, what prop you would pick, or let us know in our Discord. Um, either way. But I think I'll go first this week, Evil. <laughs> um, you and I have talked a little bit about the, the wide array of weird props in this movie, and so there's two that I kind of go back and forth with. Okay. And my first instinct is to take Jackie Earl Haley's like little garden tiller tool that's kind of the throwback <laughs> to the first Elm Street. Intense, huh? <laughs> that, that, to me, seems like the perfect deep cut prop. The other one, I kind of want the uh, the paper cutter blade that you know the faculty tool <laughs> <laughs> the, the, that man uh between this and uh, the 04 punisher paper cutters are really good murder weapons fucking a right <laughs> that, that's pretty good i uh can't fault you for that uh, i am also torn between two because the first one i want to take is i'm not sure you could qualify it as a prop because i don't know <laughs> if it's real or fake. I want to say fake, but I could be wrong. But if it is fake, truly, you give me that dead dog. Oh, nice. Being the king of dead dog props, <laughs> I want the dead dog prop. I was only trying to pet him. But <sighs> if by happenstance that's a real fucking dog just with blood splattered over the side <laughs> of it. Just holding its breath. Yeah, holding its breath, you know. Just in case. Just in case it's not my super standby one, is give me that fucking give me Quentin's epinephrine pin. Woo! But I prefer give me that dead dog prop. I want the cigar box full of kid porn. Just kidding. That's just fucking kidding. Just <laughs> give me kidding. the Polaroids, which no. Uh, you know that's not what's really on those photos, but I'm super curious. What the fuck is on all those Polaroids? Right. Like, do you think they just printed off? Are they all blank? Or do you think they like took pictures of what the like they gave a production guy? Just go around and take pictures of shit on set, and that'll be what we use in the movie. What is on those photos? There is the everlasting question for me. What is on those pictures we don't see? Yeah, because you damn well know it isn't what it's supposed to be. Um, but I would assume it's probably just Polaroid photos that a uh, production assistant snapped. Probably of random cast and crew or like eating lunch and shit. It's this Jack Earl Haley doing like hand motions and shit, so you just flip the photos real fast, it looks like he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's just some shit like that? It's just nude photos of Jack Earl Haley. <laughs> <laughs> him mooning the camera, yeah, like is this each picture is him just pulling his pants down a little bit further and then you get to see Freddy's ass. Yeah, that's that's gotta be it. That's our podcast went there. Fred Fred Kruger's butt. Yeah, <laughs> the San Andreas right. fault of Kruger is right there on camera. <laughs> Take it in, drink it in, man. Uh, it smells different. <laughs> he had Mexican. <laughs> well, that's definitely a auspicious way to wrap up the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. So we yes, went sir. to Crystal Lake, then we detoured and went over to Springwood, Ohio. Where are we going to go next, man? Where does 3B Video's Deep Cut Podcast go next? I think we need to go way out into the wilderness, cross some real shitty bridge, and spend a couple weeks in a cabin. Isolation. is, is I've heard it's always better with somebody else. That's true. I read that somewhere. <laughs> well, I, I am down to take such a journey. I think we're, we're due for a, a nice... Uh, wilderness woodsy vacation but uh i hope you bring something to read because i might get bored out there so you got a good book i could maybe crack open read a little bit while i'm out on that porch it's true i do and i also i'm gonna bring along my reel to reel so we can listen to some poetry maybe oh i i do like that idea i said we rent a car too so you know we can cram all the stuff into because i don't think either one of our cars are really qualified to make this trek i think if we had a delta we could probably make this journey a whole lot easier for us. A lot of, lot of trunk space. whole lot of trunk space to put all the things we need in there, like maybe a, a book on chemistry, you know, some uh, some rope maybe, uh, chainsaw, shotgun, gasoline, that kind of thing. Yeah. All the essentials for a couple weeks out in the wilderness. You know, I think this might be what we need. Absolutely. I agree. Let's, let's do it. All right. 
So we'll head out in two weeks. Hey, Raj, why are you why are you stopping the podcast? I ain't even cut you yet. Uh.